Hello and welcome to tonight's Fireside Chat with Lennon LaRouche for Thursday, February 24th. We will be discussing contemporary history, something that we have uh, identified over and over as being our approach. So in order to get at, uh, Lennon LaRouche often stated that events are not the origins of crisis, but crises are the origin of events. In the situation that we find ourselves in, or the world finds itself in, around Ukraine, the best thing to do is to first identify what exactly it is that Vladimir Putin is saying about the situation. Since he's the primary actor, that is, Russia is the primary actor, uh, in what uh, people purport to be going on uh, as they represent it. Uh, it's, it would be best to know what it is that he's saying. Now, I'm not saying that that representation is accurate. And as a matter of fact, it is not accurate. It is not Russia who is the primary actor here. But there is a crisis that was brought to the doorstep of Russia. Uh, and that crisis is that one that Lyndon LaRouche attempted to persuade the transatlantic world to avoid from 1975 with his International Development Bank proposal all the way through 2016 with his four new laws or four laws proposal. Um, and he was not heeded for a period of 40 years. Uh, so what Vladimir Putin stated on Monday night was the following, quote, the situation continues to deteriorate, including in the strategic area, thus positioning areas for interceptor missiles are being established in Romania and Poland as part of the U.S. Uh, project to create a global missile defense system. It is common knowledge that the launchers deployed there can be used for Tomahawk cruise missiles, offensive strike systems. In addition, the United States is developing its all-purpose standard missile 6, which can provide air and missile defense, as well as strike ground and surface targets. In other words, the allegedly defensive U.S. missile defense system is developing and expanding its new offensive capability. The information we have gives us good reason to believe that Ukraine's accession to NATO and the subsequent deployment of NATO facilities has already been decided and is only a matter of time. We clearly understand that given this scenario, the level of military threats to Russia will increase dramatically several times over. And I would like to emphasize at this point the, that the risk of a sudden strike at our country will multiply. I will explain that American strategic planning documents confirm the possibility of a so-called preemptive strike at enemy missile systems. We also know the main adversary of the United States and NATO. It is Russia. NATO documents officially declare our country to be the main threat to Euro-Atlantic security. Ukraine will serve as an advanced bridgehead for such a strike. If our ancestors heard about this, they would probably simply not believe it. We do not want to believe this today either, but it is what it is. I would like people in Russia and Ukraine to understand this. Many Ukrainian airfields are located not far from our borders. NATO's tactical aviation deployed there, including precision weapons carriers, uh, uh, will be ca they will be capable of striking at our territory to the depth of the Volgograd, that's Stalingrad, for people who don't recognize it, Volgograd, Kazan, Samara, Astrakhan line. The deployment of reconnaissance radar on Ukrainian territory will allow NATO to tightly control Russia's airspace up to the Urals. Finally, after the U.S. destroyed the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Pentagon has been openly developing many land-based attack we weapons, including ballistic missiles that are capable of hitting targets at a distance of up to 5,500 kilometers. If deployed in Ukraine, such systems would be able to hit targets in Russia's entire European part. The flying time of Tomahawk cruise missiles to Moscow will be less than 35 minutes. Ballistic missiles from Kharkov will take seven to eight minutes and hypersonic assault weapons four to five minutes. It is like a knife to the throat. I have no doubt that they hope to carry out these plans, as they did many times in the past. Expanding NATO eastward, 
moving their military infrastructure to Russian borders and fully ignoring our concerns, protests, and warnings. Excuse me, but they simply did not care at all about such things and did whatever they deemed necessary. Okay, so that's what Vladimir Putin believes is going on, and he is acting accordingly. Now, uh, uh, an article uh, was released on February 21st called Uncovered Document Revealed Soviet Union Was Promised No NATO Expansion at End of Cold War. Subtitle, at a 1991 meeting... Western Western officials said the Soviet Union was promised that NATO would not expand beyond Germany's Elba border. Uh, And so the document came from the British National Archives. Uh, It was uh, printed in the German newspaper Der Spiegel. The document is the minutes of a meeting between foreign ministry officials from the United States, France, Germany, and Britain in Bonn on March 6th. 1991, Uh, and the officials, uh, okay, and here's what it says, quote, uh, and this is a quote from the 1991 meeting, quote, we made it clear in the two plus four negotiation that we would not expand NATO beyond the Elba River. We can therefore not offer NATO membership to Poland and the others. German diplomat Jürgen Troborg said at the 1991 meeting. So now, uh, and, and, and then another official uh, named Raymond Seitz, quote, we have made it clear to the Soviet Union in two plus four talks and elsewhere that we will not take advantage of the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Eastern Europe. Okay, so that is the actual record as it has now come out. And, of course, you are not going to read either what Vladimir Putin had to say about his actual concern or about that document uh, from the British uh, National Archives. Now, the uh, actual matter that is under is under discussion is something called the Russia-China Joint Agreement, which happened at the beginning of February, and was called by various uh, uh, no, uh, American uh, commentators uh, a momentous uh, document. Now, that document, which is uh, has been signed and was discussed at the beginning of the Olympic taxes, says the following, the the sides, meaning the two, Russia, China, are gravely concerned about serious international security challenges and believe that the fates of all nations are interconnected. No state can or should ensure its own security separately from the security of the rest of the world and at the expense of the security of other states. The international community should actively engage in global governance to ensure universal, comprehensive, indivisible, and lasting security. Uh, The Russian side reaffirms its support for the one China principle, confirms that Taiwan is an inalienable part of China, and opposes any form of independence of Taiwan. Important to read that. Russia and China stand against attempts by external forces to undermine security and stability in their common adjacent regions. Now, note one thing, just for people who who need to know this. There are 14 countries on the border of Russia and 14 countries on the border of China. So uh, so understand what this means. I won't go on and read more because we want to get to the main presentation. But um, uh, it says the sides, Russia and China, oppose further enlargement of NATO and call on the North Atlantic uh, Alliance to abandon its ideologized Cold War approaches to respect sovereignty, security, and interests of other countries, the diversity of their civilizational, cultural, and historical backgrounds, uh, and to exercise a fair and objective attitude toward the peaceful development of other states. Many other things in this document. You can get it online. I suggest that everybody actually get it and read it. Um, Now, let us remember that in November, at the the, uh, the Halloween summit that began October 31st, but in November at COP26, Prince Charles, uh, speaking on that occasion, said the following, with a growing population placing an increasing strain on the planet's finite finite resources, we have to reduce emissions urgently, and then said that what was needed was, quote, a warlike footing to force you through this radical change in the economy. Uh, This is important to keep in mind because the problem that we are dealing with here 
is that it is necessary to go to a higher manifold. It, it is not enough to negate NATO, uh, and even if this will lead to, and it may very well lead to, some level of disintegration of NATO, because NATO now has to consider, are they willing to go to nuclear war, a thermonuclear war, uh, in, in the case of Ukraine? Because, in fact, that is precisely uh, the character of Russian warfighting doctrines. That is, once you wake it up, that's what's happened, you get total war. They do not have a concept of limited war in the way in which persons we uh, uh, would prefer to interpret that. It does not mean they're going to total war, nor does it mean uh, more than that what was, at, what was done was that they were ignored. They said some things in December. They said exactly what they wanted. Nothing happened. They were ignored. And now they are not. Uh, so, however, the LaRouche idea has to do with the concept of what is called the LaRouche Four Laws. We'll be discussing that. I'm sure Jerry will take that up in the course of his presentation tonight. Uh, and it's also the concept of, uh, and you've seen it in the statement that we've written, which is available on the Schiller Institute site. I'm going to actually read that statement, I think, a little bit later in, in, in the program. But I'll just indicate that you should all go to uh, the Schiller Institute site. If you haven't been there already, I, I assume a lot of people – have seen this, uh, and I will uh, uh, just, just uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get it up on my uh, iPad, which is taking a bit to, to uh, come up. Um, but the concept is that we want everybody to get this statement out. It was made to be short, to be a kind of petition, uh, and to be uh, endorsed uh, by people uh, so that what happens is that the uh, you know, there's one voice that we want to speak through, through in the entire country. Uh, uh, just having a problem with my Internet here. So I'll have to get, get, get back to this and read it as I get it. So let me now say uh, the presentation tonight, uh, which will be given by Jerry Rose, uh, is going to discuss, as he said, what the actual Cold War was. Uh, and the context is, is clear, I think, from the remarks that we've given. Uh, I guess I, the only thing I want to add is at the conclusion of this presentation, or as we conclude the presentation, let's uh, have the idea that coming out of this phone call, three things are going to happen. Number one, that the petition document that we have, uh, which I will make, make sure I read at the immediate conclusion of Jerry's presentation, uh, is read by all of you and circulated as widely as possible. There's also video material and other material we have. That's one. Two, we definitely need uh, an increase in our financial resources in order to be able to get this out as rapidly as possible. And three, and very importantly, to the degree that we can project people like, whether it's Harley Schlanger or Helga Sepp-Larouche herself or other of our spokespersons, into the situation, whether that be an intervention in the conference setting online or some other, it's going to be essential that we do that. Um, so I will uh, stop there and ask that Jerry uh, begin the presentation. So Jerry, are you with us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're you're all right. You're okay. I think okay, I'm doing, doing the best. Clear, I can. You'll be fine. Okay. Now, Charles, uh, I'm going to ask you to leave out. I just wanted to play the part that Daniel and uh, given time constraints and I can do some things. I just want you to play the part, not right now, where Daniel uh, and Mike Leppig do the two two critical scenes from, uh, from the as he saw it. Just leave my part out. I'm going to give a little introduction here, and then we're going to go to that, and then I'm going to make the broader points, okay? okay. So uh, okay. Let, me, let me do first what – let me give an introduction here. Uh, we're going to listen to um, uh, a – I adapted the As He Saw It, uh, written by Elliot Roosevelt, uh, into a larger uh, uh, docudrama. Uh, this we're certainly not going to listen to tonight or, or 
see. We, we, uh, we're trying to put it together as a whole. But the question of war, which Franklin Roosevelt uh, understood clearer than anyone, any American president, because he had been through two world wars, first as undersecretary of the Navy in World War I, and then later as president of the United States. And uh, his insight, which we're going to present in excerpt, two excerpts from his discussion with his son, Elliot, and there has never been, to my knowledge, and I, I've done a lot of work on this, there's never been a, a, a direct, the direct words of a president of the United States in a more candid form than what we're going to present right now. So, Charles, just let's do the two uh, uh the, the adaptation from the as he saw it, not my part, okay? Now, uh, I have the first one is about five minutes long? Yes, right. And, th and the next one is either one and a half minutes or four minutes. Which one? Four minutes. Not from me. Okay. Not from me. I'm talking about... Right, no, not from you. Not from you. Not from you. Yeah. I got yeah, you. Right. So here we go okay. with the first one, okay? Yeah. Stop me if this is not it. Father's thoughts turned to the problem of the colonies and the colonial markets. The problem which he felt was at the core of all chances for future peace. The thing is, the colonial system means war. Exploit the resources of an India, a Burma, a Java. Take all the wealth out of those countries but never put anything back into them. Things like education, decent standards of living, minimum health requirements. All you're doing is storing up the kinds of trouble that leads to war. All you're doing is negating the value of any kind of organizational structure for a peace before it begins. The look that Churchill gets on his face when you mention India. India should be made a commonwealth at once. After a certain number of years, five perhaps, or ten, she should be able to choose whether she wants to remain in the empire or have complete independence. As a commonwealth, she would be entitled to a modern form of government, an adequate health and educational standard. But how can she have these things when Britain is taking all the wealth of her national resources away from her every year? Every year, the Indian people have one thing to look forward to, like death and taxes. Sure as shooting, they have a famine. The season of the famine, they call it. I must tell Churchill what I found out about his British Gambia today. The Bathurst. This morning, at about 8.30, we drove through Bathurst to the airfield. The natives were just getting to work in rags, glum looking. They told us the natives would look happier around noontime when the sun should have burned off the dew and the chill. I was told the prevailing wage for these men was one and nine. One shilling, nine pence. Less than fifty cents. An hour. A day. 
50 cents a day, besides which they are given a half cup of rice, dirt, disease, very high mortality rate. Life expectancy. Yeah. You would never guess what it is. 26 years. Those people are treated worse than the livestock. Their cattle live longer. Churchill may have thought I wasn't serious last time. He'll find out this time. The big four. Ourselves, Britain, China, the Soviet Union. We'll be responsible for the peace of the world after... If, if... When, when we've won the war, the four great powers will be responsible for the peace. It's already high time for us to be thinking about the future. France, for example... France will have to take its rightful place in the United Nations. These great powers will have to assume the task of bringing education, raising the standards of living, improving the health conditions of all the backward, depressed, colonial areas of the world. Okay, now part two. Here we go. Here we go. De Gaulle said something about French colonies, too, didn't he? I was just coming in from the past. That's right. He made it quite clear that he expects the Allies to return all French colonies immediately upon their liberation. You know, Quite apart from the fact that the Allies will have to maintain military control of the French colonies here in North Africa for months, maybe years, I'm by no means sure in my own mind that we'd be right to return France her colonies at all, ever, without first obtaining in the case of each individual colony, some sort of statement of just exactly what was planned in terms of each colony's administration. Hey, listen, Pop. I don't see this. I know the colonies are important, but after all, they do belong to France. How come we talk about not returning them? How do they belong to France? Why does Morocco, inhabited by Moroccans, belong to France? Or take Indochina. The Japanese control that colony now. Why was it a cinch for the Japanese to conquer that land? The native Indochinese have been so flagrantly downtrodden that they thought to themselves, Anything must be better than to live under French colonial rule. Should a land belong to France? By what logic? And by what custom? And by what historic rule? Yes, but I'm talking about another war, Elliot. I'm talking about what will happen to our world if, after this war, we allow millions of people to slide back into the same semi-slavery. And besides, we should have some say. We're the ones that are freeing France. Don't think for a moment, Elliot, that Americans would be dying in the Pacific tonight if it hadn't been for the short-sighted greed of the French and the British and the Dutch, shall we allow them to do it all, all over again? Your son 
we'll be about the right age, 15 or 20 years from now. The United Nations, when they're organized, they could take over these colonies, couldn't they? Under a mandate or as trustee for a certain amount of years. When we've won the war, I will work with all my might and main to see to it that the United States is not wheedled into the position of accepting any plan that will further France's imperialistic ambitions or that will aid or abet the British Empire in its imperial ambitions. Yeah, so this was Elliot Roosevelt's direct conversation with his father. And for me, this was the, this book and the adaptation that I made is the final piece of the puzzle. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had lived through two wars caused by British, by the British Empire. Uh, the French and the Dutch were minor partners, and there's a whole history to that. So the intention of the Bretton Woods Agreement at the end of the war, the, the, the underlying intention was that Russia, uh, with the discussion with, directly with Franklin Roosevelt and later with uh, Harry Dexter White, Russia, who had taken the brunt of the war, who had lost 23 million people, was and we had an excess of machine tools and this was uh, discussed that a development loan would be uh, 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 made to russia this was part of the bretton woods agreement uh, in which they could industrialize and become a modern nation now there's a whole story behind that i'm not going to go through it tonight but that was, that was one of the intentions of Bretton Woods. The other intention of Bretton Woods was that China, both the Guomindang and the Communist Party, agreed to present Sun Yat-sen's proposal for international loans to develop infrastructure, particularly rail infrastructure, and there was a whole plan that Sun Yat-sen had made. He was called the Lincoln uh, of, of China. And that both parties agreed. And that these international loans would allow for the development of China. The British went wild. Because if you develop Russia, as a modern industrial nation, it was the Soviet Union at that point. And if you develop China uh, uh, with international loans, what would be called the British geopolitics was to make sure that all of Europe was divided against Russia, uh, uh, divided against China, if you look at the history of relationships with Russia, of the British Empire, they had a pathological uh, uh, obsession, uh, which later, when they developed what was called the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, 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 with actually American help. Um, and that was to link up through France, and to link up the what the the insane British geopoliticians called the heartland, the the Eurasian heartland, 
if that was to occur, and this was before World War I this was occurring, uh, 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 then that would be the end of the British Empire. And they knew it. Uh, and they were using American methods to develop the uh, uh, infrastructure, particularly Bismarck. There's a whole story involved in this stuff. But that the intention of Bretton Woods was to unleash with the dollar based upon the vast industrial capacity of the United States that every nation in the world uh, uh, through the uh, uh, Bretton Woods agreements would have a central bank, not a, a national bank, not going to central banking. This was the debate uh, 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 throughout uh, going into the Bretton Woods that every nation would have their own bank and that the credit would be issued through their national banks to uh, concentrate on industrial development. Uh, that the United States, through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, as they did in Brazil, uh, as the credit institutions, the Credit Anschau for Vida Alfa, which actually did occur, would concentrate on vast infrastructure projects, including and emphatically uh, unleashing and the Indians uh, uh, proposed, and this is under British uh, uh, rule, the Indians that went to Bretton Woods proposed an international grouping that would concentrate on looking where the Tennessee Valley Authority type projects uh, could be developed worldwide. One of the big ones was in the Danube uh, Basin. All of this was to occur through, set, through national banking institutions uh, uh, and a, 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 uh, through the World Bank, the initial impulse of the World Bank and the stabilization of the currency so that you could carry on world trade, this was the death knell for the British Empire. And Franklin Roosevelt was very clear, as you heard in these two excerpts, it was very clear that if you do not do this, you will have war. And uh, uh, as uh, in the docudrama, I documented 25 wars from 1945 to today that the United States in the Cold War had unleashed 25 wars. And when Truman, who came in to basically bury particularly the relationship that Franklin Roosevelt had developed with Russia, uh, in which these credit and related institutions were to occur, because Russia and China, and this was the, the, uh, both Stalin and Churchill, uh, uh, didn't want China in there, uh, in the original Security Council. And Franklin Roosevelt said, I'm not going to have a white man's club uh, dictate to the world what's going to happen. If China is not part of the Security Council, then the United States will not join the U.S. So both uh, Stalin and uh, Churchill had to shut up on that. But that China and Russia were going to be with the United States the bulwark to end colonial empire, which had caused two world wars. And I don't think Roosevelt could have been clearer on this question. And therefore, as I said in the introduction, which I did not play, World War II 
really never ended. Because Truman, under the direction of, and this is a story that Putin knows very well, and we've documented it voluminously, is that at the Yalta conference, the day of the Yalta conference, Alan Dulles, who was uh, part of the Brown Brothers Harriman uh, a banking institution. Well, it was a it was a bank, really. Uh, Alan Dulles, the day of Yalta, was meeting with uh, 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 an Operation Sunrise with Commander Wolf of the Nazi SS. The day of Yalta. And he was trying to create a separate piece with a section of the SS so that they would allow the United States to get to Berlin way before Russia did. Now, Roosevelt would have none of that. But this was done the day Yalta occurred to blow up the Yalta agreements, any agreements out of Yalta. And as we know, and this is all documented, what I'm telling you is all documented. At the end of the war, Alan Dulles was working with a section of the SS so that they could maintain their operations after the defeat of Hitler in Eastern Europe and throughout Latin America to, quote, fight the communists. Now, Franklin Roosevelt had just made an agreement with Russia and China for their development, uh, that, uh, uh, that they were prepared to work as part of the community of nations to found a lasting peace. And in a brilliant book by Susan Butler, this is documented. So the so the uh, so the British uh, uh, synarchists, along with Wall Street, and remember Wall Street and London, worked with Yalmer Schacht to set up the Nazi war machine and made money, massive money. Uh, 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 off the Nazi war machine. And this was called the Synarchist. And these are the people. This is not, you think the first time these guys worked with Nazis <laughs> was in Ukraine? No, Ukraine was part of the rat line. Was part of the uh, 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 part of the uh, 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 really the Anglo and now the Anglo-American uh, um, uh, Cold War apparatus. That's what Putin is dealing with here. And the second Truman got in, he overthrew every single one of Roosevelt's policies he, along with Churchill, brought the French back into Indochina, brought the Dutch back into Indonesia, tried to crush the Indians, not to good effect, in fact, right? But then, then the, the apparatus, you see, they never had a problem with Hitler. Do you know the, the Time magazine in, 19, in the 1920s declared Mussolini the man of the year? And Time magazine made Hitler, uh, 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 you know, gave great praise to Hitler's Germany as coming back? No, it's only when they took over France, 
they wanted the the uh, Germans and the Russians to bleed each other to death. And when Hitler turned on them and started bombing London and took over France, that's when they sided with Roosevelt, came begging Roosevelt to enter the war. These guys hated Roosevelt the whole time he was in, from 1933 and 1936. Every single, the New York Times, every single major newspaper hated Franklin Roosevelt. Wall Street hated Franklin Roosevelt. And in his final speech in 1936, his rendezvous with destiny speech, he said, Wall Street hates me. Isn't that grand? And he meant it. And it was the largest defeat. Uh, Roosevelt won by the largest landslide to that time in American history because he had mobilized the population through his fireside chats and through his discussions of what we're going to do to solve our problems. Uh, And the, the second he died, Harriman who was the ambassador to Russia, told uh, Truman, we we got to go against the Russians. When all the time he was he, under Roosevelt, he was forced to toe the line in terms of a community of nations coming out of the war and ending uh, uh, and ending colonial slavery as the as the mission so that we don't get into wars again. And uh, tr- uh, Truman accepted, and it is, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but Truman accepted this guy, uh, Nietzsche, who was a uh, an investment banker, and his policy, NSC 68, in which uh, Kennan, who had proposed the Cold War, in the, what's called the long letter or the long telegram, um, but in fact, Nietzsche, uh, who again was an investment banker, uh, uh, proposed that we fight preemptive war against Russia. Bertrand Russell had proposed a preemptive strike against Russia before they had the nuclear weapon. Uh, that didn't uh, function, uh, but Nietzsche proposed uh, 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 covert operations, overthrowing governments, uh, 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 which they did in uh, in Iran. They overthrew a moderate government. Uh, 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 so, so that the intelligence agencies were given carte blanche to run illegal activities uh, 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 to basically create a, a, um, a climate uh, of total confrontation with Russia and China. Well, because of that, the Russians and the Chinese went into a hard, cold war. And Korea, the Korean War was the result of the insanity of Truman. And in fact, it is what overthrew him. Uh, uh, And Eisenhower was elected in order to stop the Korean War. Now, simultaneously with the uh, uh, Nietzsche doctrine, uh, which Truman followed, was the, through the uh, uh, McCarthy period, was an attempt to wipe out Roosevelt's network of supporters Even after he died, he had a massive network of supporters for what he had done for the 12 years in which the United States didn't listen to Wall Street, 
ran against Wall Street, created the institutions of Glass-Steagall, created the institution of national banking through the, uh, through the uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and, and basically, uh, 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 I can't go through all the details, I've done it before, uh, we had created that, so he had a massive following within the United States. The first person they went after uh, in the McCarthy period was Harry Dexter White, the man who negotiated the Bretton Woods Agreement. And they went after him, and he fought back very hard. But ultimately, uh, uh, through the press and related activities, the uh, Henry Wallace, who was the uh, vice president uh, before Truman, who uh, was totally with Roosevelt on the development uh, of the uh, rest of the world, he negotiated with China. Uh, uh, what's his name? Dexter White negotiated with Russia. Uh, uh, that they use the the internal network to try the uh, the red purges or the red scares to wipe out Roosevelt and the legacy of Roosevelt. It didn't work. Remember, Eisenhower was the uh, 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 next to uh, Marshall. But Eisenhower was Roosevelt's top military man, and he loved Roosevelt. And Eisenhower came in in 52 with the mandate to end the Korean War. And what did he want to do? He went to General MacArthur, who had won the Korean War at Incheon, and Harry Truman refused to negotiate a settlement after Incheon because they wanted the tension. They wanted the covert operation. The military budget before the Cold War was $10 billion. In the uh, four years ensuing under Truman, it went to $40 billion. It increased by 400%. And Eisenhower said, I'm going to sit down with Marshal Stalin, and we're not going to invite uh, um, uh, Stalin. I mean, we're not going to invite Churchill to this meeting. Stalin and I are going to sit down, and we're going to end the Korean War, and we're going to end the Cold War. We're going to sign peace treaties, and we're going to uh, move, uh, we're going to do what we should have done. Because he had a very good relationship with Stalin because of Roosevelt and Roosevelt's intention, and he knew what Roosevelt's intention was. Unfortunately, Stalin died at that point, so it, it didn't quite work out. But when, uh, but what, um, in the Adams for Peace program, Eisenhower had proposed that the world develop with the United States and Russia in the lead, the, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, atomic energy would be used for peaceful means for every nation on the planet to show that uh, 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 what our commitments were. And I'm not going to read it. There's a very beautiful article that uh, Dean uh, Andromedus writes on this subject. And, and then Eisenhower went after this Nitsa doctrine uh, and pared it down and uh, brought the attempted to bring uh, things under control, but unfortunately, uh, he did not have the political acumen of Franklin Roosevelt. 
I'm reading Franklin Roosevelt's uh, letter, uh, uh, his actual correspondence. He was political since the age of 20. He was in government for, well, he was the governor, he was a state rep, he uh, was uh, he he was he had political acumen, in depth political acumen. Unfortunately, Eisenhower did not have that, so he had Arthur Burns, a monetarist, uh, as the Treasury Secretary, and he had John Foster Dulles as the Secretary of State. Now you know th- this makes a point. Because Putin has a government that he's developed. He gets things done, right? Uh, um, Xi Jinping has a government that he developed. You can't serve on the Central Committee of the Chinese uh, Central Committee unless you've run, a, 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 unless you were a governor and have actually worked with people, uh, 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 I mean, um, tens of millions of people, helping them govern, right? So that you have a sense of the general welfare, you have a sense of how things can get done. And unfortunately, Eisenhower was surrounded, and he warned at the end that the military-industrial complex must be controlled must be brought under control. Otherwise, they would have un, un, real, uh, uh, you know, unimagined power and unimagined wealth. And he warned of that. And Kennedy, who picks up the Roosevelt tradition, and, and I, I listened to his uh, American University speech, and people should listen to that, which is why he got killed. He, with MacArthur, and the old Roosevelt traditions were saying we will not engage in colonial wars. Every single one, every single one of the top people of Roosevelt's uh, uh, military hated the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Eisenhower, MacArthur, Leahy abhorred what was done on that. And therefore, Kennedy represented that tradition, that idea. And if you listen to the ending of his speech uh, at American University, you understand what this idea of America, this idea of our commitment, this idea of what mankind is comes across clearly. And after the murder of Kennedy, you had maybe the greatest statesman in history, scientific statesman in history, who came at it from a different standpoint, from the standpoint of creativity per se, which is Lyndon LaRouche, and many of the Donovan and the uh, grouping that was around uh, uh, this idea of America grouped around Lyndon LaRouche privately. As he reached out to Russia, as he reached out to China, as he reached out to uh, India, and realize that you had to put an international combination together to break the power of Britain, the Sinarchist, and the internal power of Wall Street as a combination to ensure that mankind, the idea of mankind, the idea of development, the idea that every child has a future, and how to do that scientifically. That's what Lyndon LaRouche represented. 
And the and the, now we have we are at the break point of the British Empire. Of the British flying mold with Wall Street. And they are they are overplayed their hand. You now have Russia and China, their biggest nightmare. You now have the the uh, commitment to the Silk Road and the industrial corridor throughout Eurasia, and 150 nations are now committed to that. That didn't happen by accident. That happened through this history that I'm saying with Lyndon LaRouche, with Franklin Roosevelt, with Kennedy, with Eisenhower in a different way. And the, and the, the combination that Helga has uh, really fighting for, we have to go to a higher commitment, a higher understanding Of what our commitments are, you, you, we have to go to central banking. We have to go to Britain, uh, to a, uh, a a glass eagle kinds of banking, internal banking. We have to uh, commit ourselves to massive industrial expansion, which Russia, China, India, maybe. But these international, and we have to fight like hell. We have to become, the people on this phone have to become the voice of reason and the leadership of this country. And I'm going to end with just a, a little quote from Sukarno at the Bandung Conference. And it makes a real important point. Great chasms yawn between nations and groups of nations. This is after 1954. It was a very difficult time. Our unhappy world is torn and tortured, and the peoples of all countries walk in fear lest, through no fault of their own, the dogs of war are unchained once again. The nations of Asia and Africa cannot, even if they wish to, avoid their part in finding solutions to these problems. We have heavy responsibilities to ourselves and to the world and to the yet unborn generation. The peoples of Asia and Africa wield little physical power what can we do? We can do much. We can inject the voice of reason into world affairs. We can mobilize all spiritual, all moral, all the political strength of Asia and Africa on the side of peace. And then he says, I'm skipping here, Today, meaning the founding of the Bandung Conference, is a famous anniversary in that battle against colonialism. On the 18th of April, 1775, just 180 years ago, Paul Revere rode at midnight through the New England countryside, warning the approach of the British troops and the opening of the American War for Independence, the first successful anti-colonialist war in history. About this midnight ride, the poet Longfellow wrote, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. I think this is an inspiration for us in, and the world. And I think, you know, Diane's campaign and others 
uh, uh, representing that we must become the leadership of this country. Both parties have failed. It's a disgusting moral failure. And we have to uh, uh, lead this country, and we have to be competent, and we have to be prepared to lead, because I think people are prepared to listen now, given the lateness of the date, but also the great potential of these new alliances that are emerging. So that's what I have.